Okay, so you're all going to pick, and Samantha, you already did this, but you can pick again if you want, but we're gonna start with Carmen. Um, we're gonna pick just some, some dice, and you're gonna create a story. And our job is to start asking you questions, because one of the things in this profession is that we have to ask the right questions. So when someone tells us a story, a client, which they will, we need to be able to feel comfortable asking more information about, so that we can pull information from them. Okay, so close your eyes and pick three. and tell me a story. Now, why do we want to hear stories from our clients? To make an inference of what is really going on. Exactly. Because behind the story, we're going to get the reality of what's happening. So, the way that this works is that we all come from a story. I always have this saying that says there are no new stories. Every story has already been told. And our job is to find out what story they're really telling us. That's one of the reasons why we use myth. It's one of the reasons why we use fairy tale, why we use literature. Because what we do is that we're going to find that story being mimicked in our clients' lives. Every story basically is a different costume, different players, maybe a different religion, maybe a different culture, but it's the same story that we find in mythology or fairy tale. And so we have to ask questions so that we can elicit responses from our clients. So you're going to tell us a story with your three symbols, and we're going to ask you questions about the story, okay? So asking questions. Why do we need to ask questions? Absolutely, because of the detail. And the more details we have, the more we're going to see if the client is incongruent, with the story. I was listening the other day to a client tell a story and she starts telling me that she's not confrontational. Well, later on in her story, she starts to tell me how she's in her family, the one that confronts everybody and that she tells people how it is and that she's, you know, the, completely in con contradiction. So we are listening for those contradictions when we ask questions, we're looking for the detail in the story to see, hmm, could this person be saying something different when they, they mean something else? And one of the things that we've learned in previous classes is that if students or clients tell us an incongruence, they tell us one thing but they mean another, they tell us two different things, that's where we have an opportunity to help them change. So incongruence is actually an opportunity. So I did this activity with these students in a, in a different school uh, several years ago. And the girl had to talk about pizza. And she says, I like thin crust. So what am I, what am I doing with my hand? I like thin crust. But this is thick or thin? That's Stuff. This is double <laughs> stuff. This is thick. But she said, I like thin crust. So I pointed out to her the incongruence of what she was saying with her nonverbal.
versus what was she was she saying. Aware? Or, well, did she actually mean thin or did she mean thick? No, she meant thin, but this is not an accident. That's one of the things that we do with clients. We pay attention to nonverbals. Are they shaking? Are they jittery? Are they moving a lot? Are they not looking at you and giving you eye contact? Are they making gestures? The other day, James made a gesture like this when he was describing a movie and he was talking about limitations. And when we discovered in the story, he doesn't like to have those rules and those limitations. So the gestures that the client is making is about what's going on in their psyche. So we're paying attention to all of these nonverbals. So that incongruence of I like thin crust is a perfect example. So tell us what 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 are your three symbols, first of all? The I, the clock, and the airplane. An I, a clock, and an airplane. And an airplane. Okay. So let's talk before you tell us your story. Well, actually, tell me your story, and then we'll I'll describe symbolically, and then we'll talk about, we'll ask your questions. It doesn't have to be anything uh, elaborate, because we're going to ask you the questions so that we can see what's really going on in the psyche. Um, for the I think I was flying above them. I wouldn't see Okay. I was seeing what was happening, but I didn't decide to like, see it. Okay, so you were blind? Uh -huh. Okay, you didn't see something? And then I was running out of time. Okay, so she didn't see something. She was running out of time. And what else? Then I catch on what's going on. And then you what? I catch on with what was going on. Okay, you caught on to what was going on. And what's the airplane? What does the airplane have to do with you not seeing this thing and then finding out? Like I took a trip and then I opened. Um, you took a trip and then you were saying you opened? I um, like. Uh, it's okay, we're gonna ask you questions and you'll be able to make it up. Like when I went on vacation, I okay. was catch on with what was going on in my room. Okay, so when you were on vacation, you had time to figure out what was really happening? Okay. Okay, so first let's talk about the symbolism of the three items. And then we'll talk about the story and we'll ask our questions. So what's the symbolism of an eye? What do we think of when we think of symbolically an eye? Okay, someone's watching you. What else? You're not alone. I guess it's the same thing as the initial one. Um. What else? Where do we see an eye? Something that we use every single day there's an eye on it. On money. There's an eye on money. It's a pyramid with an eye on it. Okay. On money. Okay. What else? There's a saying with the eye. The evil eye. There's a saying about the evil eye. Isn't that also an Illuminati symbol? Yes, all of the signs on the dollar bill are Illuminati symbols. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
They all are, they come from Freemasonry because it's Freemasons that actually created this country. Um, all of the founding fathers were Freemasons and they all believe in that secret language. Um, it's all symbolic. Everything in this country, I mean, it's fascinating. Um, if you go to Washington, D.C., that's why when you watch National Treasure or the Da Vinci Code, mm -hmm. they talk about the different symbolisms. It's absolutely accurate. And the way that D.C. Is, is designed, it's all on symbolism and Freemasonry and things like that. So our psyche thinks this way. So I have the language of the psyche. Myth, symbol, ceremony, and ritual. And another one is metaphor. So the way that the psyche sort of interprets things is through metaphor, symbol, myth, and all of those symbols are are on the dollar bill. There's one in um, Egyptian mythology. Yes. Okay, do you know what it is? The I Eye of Horus? Yes. Yes. <laughs> the That's Eye of good. Horus. Health, protection, and royal power. And yes. sometimes known as the Eye of Ra. So that Eye of Horus comes from Egyptian mythology, and it's actually about protection. It's similar to like the evil eye, like in the Latin, in my deo, like if somebody, yeah. you know, is giving you like the evil eye and wanting something bad for you. What else does the eye represent? The pine cones. Karma. Pine cone. What else does the eye represent? When you think of an eye, what do you think of? Just the, the logic of an eye. Anytime we're dealing with an organ, there's one question I taught you to ask. I read the word organ, but I didn't read the sentence. Anytime we're dealing with an organ in the body, so if somebody comes to you, this we covered in health psychology, and someone comes to you and they have an issue with a certain part of the body, you ask, what is the function of that organ? I didn't cover health psychology. No, I know. That's why I'm repeating it. So what's the function of the eye? To see, exactly. So that's the first thing. Oh, I thought I was a given, that's why I was like. But we have to kind of decipher where the client is coming from. So as a therapist, we need to have an idea of what the symbolism is of a particular thing so that we can help interpret what the client is really saying. So she may not know anything about Egyptian mm -hmm. mythology, something that I know about. So I might think of that. Oh, the eye is protective. So the other day I had a sty in my eye, a really bad sty, and I had to ask myself. It was on the left side. So the left side of the body has to do with female, and it was huge. I could hardly see. My eye wouldn't be open. So what was it that I didn't want to see, perhaps related to the feminine, perhaps related to a woman? I had to ask myself these questions, and I kind of came up with an answer and said, oh, wow, that really affected me. I wanted to just thought of was that. Because you're not trained yet to start thinking more in, de in depth. But <laughs> when, when you're in this now brain. I'm gonna think about every style. I know a friend who has those embedded under his eyelid, and he had to get surgery to get each one removed. Oh, okay. Okay. Awake, and he has like 50 on each eye. Okay. Holy cow. So there's a reason, and believe it or not, there's a reason why there's 50. There's a reason that there's the number that there are. That's all that he's going to crazy. Okay. But that's what we do in here. Yeah. But then when you start realizing that the client isn't doing anything accidentally, the subconscious doesn't do anything accidentally. The subconscious is filling in gaps for the story that you tell yourself. So you have an idea about your life. Something that your parents told you, something that you've proved to be true about yourself. The subconscious will fill in the gaps. And so, an example. Um, I go to, the, to a restaurant and I'm craving chicken tenders. 
and the waiter gives me a menu and I place my my order. What did I order? <laughs> Something that your mind told you to. What did I just tell you I was craving? I was craving chicken tenders. So subconsciously, just like the listener, the subconscious will say, oh, she ordered chicken tenders. Mm -hmm. So that's how the subconscious fills in the gap. If I tell you I go to the store and I need to buy some makeup remover, and the next day I got pimples, what are you going to infer that gave me the pimples? The makeup, the makeup or the makeup remover mm -hmm. that I bought. And so we're filling in gaps constantly in the subconscious. We do the same thing with ourselves. If you think that you're fat, if you think that you're ugly, if you think you're a loser, then you fill in the gaps that that man won't look at you because you're unattractive. And so all of a sudden, you set up a situation where the person that you're interested in or that man does not pay attention to you. And you infer that it's because you're fat or a loser or unattractive or whatever. What if it's the opposite but, and they're saying they're fat and they're ugly? Right, it's anybody. It's, it's any person. Mm -hmm. We all have a story that we tell ourselves and we think it's our reality, but it's not real. It's made up. And so our job as therapists is to listen to the story that the client has made up about themselves. They fill in the gaps. That's why we ask questions. Because when we ask questions, we can get more information from the client and identify if what they're saying is really true or not. Now, the, the client isn't intentionally wanting to lie to you. Yeah. That's not the purpose of it. It's just that this is how the mind yeah. functions. So they're filling in the gaps. What do you do with a person that says they're fat and they're ugly when they're really skinny and they're not ugly? Well, you'd have to determine if there's an eating disorder, no. if it's just, you know, something that they want, they're seeking attention perhaps, but is there a body dysphoria there that is creating them to say that they're fat? Um, also, where did they learn that judgment? By themselves. Never. We Let's do not heard. learn judgment by ourselves. Must have heard somebody or judgments judge themselves. Judgments are. Well, this doesn't mean present time. It could be that she heard it as a child, or she heard it at growing up. He. That's okay. He, uh, he eating heard disorders. He was a skinny twig. Eating, eating, eating disorders for men. Eating, eating right, and he was never eating right because his mother was never home to feed him. Okay, so there's part of the story. There's part of the story. But no, I mean, his mother wasn't home, and his mom's the one who cooks, but she, she has a job, so she comes home, but she owns a business. Dad was home, but dad doesn't really know how to cook, so dad would just like order pizza all the time, and then he got tired of eating pizza. Okay, so right there you have a story. Mm -hmm. That person inferred mm -hmm. that the mother not having time to make him food mm -hmm. meant something. The, the, the person, the child, because these things start very early on. In my model, it starts at the moment of conception. But in psychology, we say that the personality and the ego is sort of established by year seven. So by seven years old, we already have these judgments about ourselves. So we'll talk about judgments in a minute. We are understanding that we are worth it, we are lovable, Things matter, you know, about us by the way our parents treat us. Mm -hmm. So if your parent doesn't make time to come home to cook, even though she can because she owns the business, yeah. what did your friend infer? You can make it up. Just no, I, I'm actually trying to think because I want to know the problem because every day I hear the words "you're fat" and everyone's like, "You're you're literally." Um, but his issue isn't necessarily with his physical body. But he keeps saying, his I want to work out because he gained a little weight and he's been skinny all his life. So he was like, I want to go back to looking that way because all my friends look that way. But now I gained a little weight and everyone's like, no, now you look healthy. 
you look the way you're supposed to. Okay, but there's like, a reason. Work out. Before we get to the working out part, there's a reason that he must say that he's that he's fat. There's something there. So you were saying that his father ordered pizza every night. Mm -hmm, pretty much. Did he put on weight because of that? He put on weight actually about like a year or two years ago. Okay. He's 20. Okay. But he was really skinny up to his senior year of high school when he was 17, 18. Okay. So within the last two years, he gained a little weight. Why did he gain weight? Because he started eating correctly. Because he started going out with friends and going to cousin's house and their parents cooked. Or he was like, I have money now to find that job. I have money now to go out and eat with friends or go to the mall and have a snack. And okay, okay, so, so this is an easy family. one for me. Yeah, I figured. Um, <laughs> if his mother, having the ability, because she owns the business, does not make time for the child to come home and feed the child, what did the child learn about himself? Mom doesn't have time for me, and food is not important. See, I don't know about that because they're divorced now. So I think she always like told him to do something else, but he never did. Just because you're told doesn't mean you're gonna no, the do dad, it. The dad, not the child. Yeah. So that's why I was like, I think it messed up somewhere the parents because the mom's not like that. Because when she has time, she'll cook for them. And she's like, why didn't you guys eat yet? Like, she looks like she's always lost, like a part of it is missing. So we thought it was the dad that was messing up. But the mom owns a swim school. So she's always in the water. Can't have her phone on her and can't have like, a, I think she has her watch on, but it's not waterproof. So she can't always be like, hi. But she told them, if you guys want to come, you can come with me. They're little kids, I can teach you. And they were like, no. Then that was your fault because she would have taken you out to dinner every day after. Okay, but now you're placing sort of blame on the children. Yeah, no, no, no. I think it was the dad who kind of messed up in between. Both parents mess up. Yeah. Definitely. Both parents screw up the kid. Mm -hmm. So at the moment that you're conceived, this is my theory, yeah. the moment that you're conceived, every single thing that your parents qualities that they have, both good and bad, become you. Forget affect you, are in you. So you have all of your mom's qualities, good and bad, and all of your dad's qualities, good and bad. So that's the first thing, okay? So as we grow through life up until year seven, we will sort of work on those qualities. We'll enhance them or we'll deny them, and that is what we call the shadow. The shadow is sort of formed which is part of us that we deny, okay? Morning. So in this kid's case, what he's being told is that he is not worth the time to get out of the water and to go make food. Well, if he doesn't eat, or even if he does eat, that's the interesting thing about the subconscious. He could pig out and he still won't gain weight. Why? What is he trying to prove to his mother? Uh, you need to be home because look how skinny I am. No. What he's trying to tell mom is, I understand you. What you are telling me is that I'm not worth the time to eat. Therefore, mom, I am going to abide by what you say. We want our parents to approve of us. 100%. They could be the worst parents in the world but we want them to approve of us. So we develop judgments and values according to what our parents teach us. And so he is judging himself that he is fat because if he stays skinny, who is he telling I love you to? His mom. And we want approval from our parents more than absolutely anything in the world. And so in my theory, Every single person, place, thing, or situation is what? Is what? Every person, place, thing, or situation is who? Guys, you should know this like the back of your hand. <clears throat> Every single person, place, thing, or situation represents who in your life? Your mother or your father. Oh, yeah. So, yes. if, if 
the food or the weight loss or being skinny or his criticism, all of that represents mom. And so all we want is to gain our parents' love. So I guess it's different for sibling then because his sister is extremely, well not extremely overweight, but she's 18 and she's 5'9 and almost 200 pounds. Okay, that's what I call the system. But she plays water polo, so she's really muscular, but it's still a little, like you can see that it's not muscular. So usually what happens in a family, anybody have siblings? You don't have siblings. You have siblings. You have siblings? Okay. So in, in families that have siblings, usually what happens is that there's a system. And so there's going to be a pattern. In this guy's case, it's weight. Okay. There's two siblings. So one is thin and one is thick. Okay. Why does that happen? What are we trying to do? What's the whole point of the body and the psyche? So James, what's the whole purpose of the body? To maintain what? As far as... The body's function is to maintain homeostasis. Okay? The psyche is the same thing. The difference is that the body will maintain homeostasis in a positive way. Your psyche will maintain homeostasis in a destructive way. So, if he already took thin, the only thing left for her, because the issue is mom and the cooking. That's the problem. There's only two solutions. Be skinny or be thick. He chose part and she chose part. I have three children. We, as good parents, screwed them up, did our job, but we have three. So one child is going to take on one way, the other child is going to take another, and the third child is going to take on a different way. And this is what happens in a family. But if you pinpoint, and I'm one of four, so the four of us took whatever the pattern was, whatever the dysfunction was in the parents, and we found four different ways to manifest it. So what we do is what we manifest the dysfunction of our parents. And every child in the system is going to do it a different way. So in my case, there's four of us. Okay? So much so, I'll give you this example. Have you guys ever heard of the disease Prater Willy? Okay, so there's this illness called the prater Willie syndrome. My oldest sister had that. My mom also didn't cook. My mom was not a, a cook. She didn't really care for food. She didn't eat much herself. So I struggled with weight. My sister's super skinny. My brother is muscular, has always been tall and handsome, but sometimes has put on weight, sometimes has hasn't. And my oldest sister, who was mentally retarded, and that's what we called it back in the day when she was living, had this disease that was called prater willy And prater willy syndrome is a disease where the person eats uncontrollably because they don't know they're sick. She was mentally retarded. And we used to have to lock up the cabinets in our house. And she died because she choked on food. So four different siblings same pattern of dysfunction, each one found a different way to work that problem, through that problem. So what he's doing and his sister is they're both trying to fix the problem in their own way. One of the reasons that, even if they move out, the parents are already in the psyche. Your parents are in the psyche at the moment of conception. To make it worse, dad left. Okay. So what happens is that we're constantly trying to fix the pattern in our life. That's why every single person, place, thing, or situation is our mom and our dad. Because if I interact with you, or I interact with James, or I interact with Carmen, what I'm trying to do is, she's my mom or my dad, is try to fix the problem. But the psyche is dysfunctional. That's why I say homeostasis is not in your favor. It's dysfunctional. The psyche, and this is the importance of story. This is the importance of the story. The client 
is going to tell you a story that's dysfunctional. We're gonna ask Carmen now and get the questions because what I want you guys to do is get comfortable asking questions. Is what happens is the psyche is going to try to solve the problem with a dysfunctional solution. But that's how we do it. That's what all of us do. That's just the way it is. If I'm afraid of something, I am going to find the antidote in something else that supposedly makes sense. To the psyche, it makes sense. But in human behavior, it's absolutely dysfunctional. Okay? So now Carmen has shared a story. So what we're doing is she picked, I'm going to give you some, some of these in a minute. Oh, there's three left. So come up with a story, one for each dice. Um, and then just come up with, with a story. Okay. There's a bunch of different pictures, and then we'll go to you. So what we want to do is a client is going to tell us a story, and we want to ask questions. Okay, so let's just recap Carmen's story. and then.